And here we are, <laughs> back again. A bit different to the old Zoom format. Thank you to our friends at Chapel Place Studios for letting this happen. Big up the guys. Free up yep. the man then. We have not got the gang signs yet, but they are loading. They're on the way. On route. Chapel something. C. Chapel Place, know. I see. We'll get something like that. Um, before we get stuck in, Senor Lundjua, how you doing, my friend? I'm good, mate. I'm good. It's nice to be face-to-face doing an actual podcast instead of being uh, a million miles away over Zoom. Well, this is where it's interesting. Not only are we face-to-face from the same continent, that's one of the first few podcasts we've actually done. I think it's, yeah, it's the first time we've done one on the same continent. It's like been all over the world except for in England. Something like that, yeah. Look at that. That's, that's a claim to fame, really, isn't it? I mean... We we'll have to work out how many countries and how many continents we've done podcasts on so far. Antarctica for the 100th podcast special, I think. <laughs> yeah. So we'll get into a lot of stuff. One thing I want to speak about is your recent sort of venture, the referee, the man himself, oh, yeah, yeah. the man inside the arena, as well as the fighters. Mm-hmm. What was that experience like? Was that your first refereeing experience? Um, no, I've done a couple of little ones. I've done um, like a couple of white collars. <laughs> they were quite interesting. Obviously, we have them only having sort of like six to eight weeks, depending on how they work it um, and stuff like that. So I've done a couple of white collar ones and then... I've done one other amateur one, but it was quite a low sort of level mm. amateur one. Um, but that was like, what, three years ago, before pandemic and before I went away traveling and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, jumping in there, you know, fresh after not doing it for refereeing for so long was was quite nerve wracking. But, you know, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was great. Um, the guys over at Berserker, awesome, awesome little show. Um, it's a nice little local show sort of to Nottinghamshire. It's based in Mansfield. It was at the Civic Centre over in Mansfield. Um, it's a team, they, they used to be called Tap or Snap, now they're called... Resurrection MMA. Resurrection MMA, there you go. Cheers, mate. There's a delay um, in the connection, you didn't forget, it's all right. Yeah, uh, Resurrection <laughs> MMA, but um, Berserker, yeah, uh, Chris is doing some good things over there, and yeah, yeah. had a great show, and, and I really, really enjoyed getting in there and, and doing my, my little refereeing spot, so it was cool. He does a lot for the, is it IMF or EMF he yes. does it for? Yes, IMF. EMF, so I'm at the international one. Who does a lot for the English Mixed Martial Arts Federation as well? Yeah, he su- just took over as head coach, mm. as like the, the England team head coach. Um, he's actually got two guys from his gym, or got one guy, one girl, um, on the junior team. I think I think Brooke is possibly 14. Mm. Um, and then the other lad is 17, I think. 16, 17. So like, they're on the junior sort of level. Um so, yeah, he's took over as head coach there. So he'll start and putting the team together ready for the, the Europeans and the Worlds sort of like next year. That's fantastic. And yeah. these kind of things are so important because where it comes to MMA to the <coughs> mainstream, the more commercialised things, much like the shin guards, things like that, because mm-hmm. as much as the authenticity of it, obviously, is no shin guards, small gloves, it's as authentic as possible. Mm. To make it marketable, you see the Olympics, it yeah. tries to be as sport-like as possible opposed to a fight, which you get that kind of happy medium anyway. But with the refing I wanted to get into was obviously we've spoken about refing from an outside point of view, the armchair, the quarterback kind of yeah. idea that, you know, oh, yeah, how did you make that mistake? How could you see that? How did you find your performance as a referee from almost a, I don't know, a neutral point of view? What did you felt you did well? Where did you feel you, I don't know? Um, I thought I did all right. Um, I got some good compliments on the night. People were saying that they liked the way I refed. I was quite fair with the refereeing and, you know, I kind of let stuff go as, as, long, as, as long as I sort of could. Um, I did have a bit of, obviously, the rules meeting at the start. Mm. And, you know, I'm a fighter's fighter. You know, I love to see them have as much chance as they can. Uh, And I'm I'm a fighter's referee as well, which is what I told them. But they had to remember that they were only amateur. So I was going to step in a little bit quicker than I would do if they were pros, especially when it comes to arm bars and leg locks and stuff like that. Um, And then, obviously, just taking damage for no reason and stuff like Mm. that. So there was one or two of the fights where I had to really have a look. And they weren't hurt as in, like, they were kind of all over the place. Um, but they were kind of gassing and being hit. Mm. So I kind of, <clears throat> I let go as long as I could, but then obviously stepped in. So yeah, I, I got quite a few, you know, well done for, for kind of letting it go as much as I could, but then stepping in at the right time. Um, I thought I did all right. Um, I, I'm going to have to watch a few of my That's fights it. back just to sort of like check out. But um, I did notice myself <laughs> kind of getting involved. Have you ever seen, I can't remember what the guy's called. It's a black referee is in boxing. And there's loads of memes. Yeah, yeah, there's loads of memes Loves of it, it where he's like, he's watching a fight and he's like, wow, wow, wow the punch is being thrown. But then he's a really good ref as well. I actually noticed myself doing that myself and I kind of had to stop myself. Like somebody would be throwing a kick. I was like, oh, good kick. Oh. I was like, oh, shit, I'm Tony refereeing. Tony hit next time. Like, yeah, I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> shit, I'm refereeing. I've got to remember what I'm actually doing. But um, yeah, because I was obviously watching the fight, but watching it so close I was kind of like enjoying the shots and stuff like that, but yeah, no, it was great. I really enjoyed it. I'm actually refereeing again um, on a fight show again in Nottingham on the 
possibly the 11th of December um, for a guy called Neil Huntley over at Harvey Haddon. So, yeah, that's going to be interesting. So that'll be, I'll be a little bit more relaxed for this one mm. in the way that I won't be as nervous because I haven't had a three-year layoff now. It's going to be a couple of weeks and I kind of, you know, got in a little... In, once I've got the first fight or so out of the way, I kind of got in a flow of it and I yeah, really started enjoying it from then onwards. So this one I'm really looking forward to. It's going to be good fun. With the refing in general, the reason I'm asking that question, because again, it's very interesting from what you're seeing versus what yep. you're experiencing and what's there. For one thing you touched on there is the fatigue sort of stoppages. Yep. And I think that's a very important thing, especially at the amateur level, is you see it in your time. happened to me a few times where you just gas yeah. and you just become more vulnerable. Yeah, and like, whether or not you're actually going to get hurt, like the shot that dropped me in my last fight, it wasn't even a painful thing. It was just off balance and no. fatigue without the yeah. urgency to get up. It looks worse than it is. But again, from a ref point of view, it's a safety thing. Yeah. And where it's really interesting for you saying that is appreciating that side of things. That it's not the shot you're gonna, you, you've taken so far as what you could take. Yeah. If your hands are down and you're slowly lumping towards, you're just asking for punishment. Yeah. And to be able to sort of appreciate that, but also give them the chance to, I don't know, have that experience. And mm -hmm. You see it at the kids where if an arm even gets a little bit extended, it's already stopped. Yeah. But with amateur, you have to get a chance to on your own terms. But then you're that happy medium of you're not going to go out on your shield for a plastic medal and a trophy you're never going to do much with. No, 100%. And like I say, so they're not getting paid for this. It's amateur. You know, it's fun or it's it's either for fun because they want to feel what it's like to get in there and, and, you know, experience the fight sort of scenario and everything else that goes with it. Or it's learning for when they eventually do turn professional and they are getting paid for it. And then they can take more chances. And breaking arms and stuff, if you're getting paid for it, then that's fair enough. You've signed the contract, you put the name to the paper, you know, you know the... the, the, the um, what you signed up for? Yeah, you, you know what you've signed for, up for, exactly, and you're there. But obviously amateur, you know, you've got to, I said to him, you've got to go to work on Monday morning. So, you know, if I see your arm and it's hyperextended, but, you, you know, you're toughing it out, we're all fighters at heart and we don't want to quit on ourselves. So you're kind of toughing it out a little bit, then I'm going to step in and stop it. Um, but with the fatigue thing, there was a couple of fights that... Um, especially sort of like the ground and pound. Mm. There was, you know, coming to the third round, they're both absolutely knackered. One guy ended up getting the mount position and, you know, he's hitting the guy and the guy's kind of blocking and the punches aren't getting through. He's not getting hurt, mm. but I can see he's kind of booking a little bit, but he's just got not the energy to get out of the situation. Mm. I'm like, I'm kind of looking at, the, uh, looking at the timekeeper and he's like, yeah, there's two minutes left. And I'm like, he's just going to basically sit here for two minutes and take shots. Maybe not to the head, maybe to the arms mm. and stuff, but there's just no point. So there was a couple of... Um, situations where that happened where I kind of you know I let him go right okay I'm counting my head I'm like one two three okay five six seven eight I was like right he took eight shots he's mm. not been hit to the head he's hitting the arms with eight shots he's not even attempted to try and get out of the situation in a technical way he's just kind of like really tired mm. booking a little bit so I've just kind of stopped that and then there was um one that I definitely looked at quite close um again sort of third round um Guy had gone after it the first couple of rounds. You yeah. could tell third round he was blowing a little bit, you know, starting to struggle. Um, he was kind of turning his back and kind of running away a little bit when the guy was landing shots. And then the guy did land, you know, one or two really nice sort of clean shots. They weren't enough to hurt him, as in like he wasn't wobbled, his eyes mm. weren't glazed or anything, so he wasn't like rocked in any way, but they were landing clean shots to the chin, clean shots to the temple. He took two or three of those, and then he was kind of like half defending, half trying to turn and run away and, you know, he, he, he kind of pinned him on the fence, landed two or three more shots kind of on the arms and I was just like, that's enough. Because the, the whole round would have just been him sort of like taking a clean shot, then trying to run away, taking a clean shot, mm. trying to run away. And that's not, it's not intelligent defending like we tell people at the start before we even, before we even go in there. So, yeah, it was good. It was good fun. And it was, it was nice to, to sort of use my experience and put it into, like you say, getting in the middle and getting in between and sort of like, you know, we all we all criticise referees mm. all the time, so it was it was nice to sort of use my criticism for myself to try and make me a better referee, if that makes sense. That's what you're saying then, being a fighter's referee, but one thing you touched on there, which is the perfect term I wanted to get into, was intelligent defending. Yeah. Now, that terminology, what you said <coughs> there, is exactly an example. If you're in mount defending shots, that's one thing, but unless you're trying to show initiative to try to be escaping... Yeah. you're not showing a referee any reason that you're not going to take more damage. No. Because that's all it is from a referee's point of view. It doesn't care who wins. Mm. It's a safety thing. Yeah. And like with the arm hyperextended, prime example, if you just sat there just gritting your teeth, 
you're holding it, you're waiting for it to go. It's not intelligently defended. Are you moving? You, are you bucking? It, are you doing something? You go, are you yeah, if you're doing a backwards roll, trying to twist out of it and get your arm actually out and stuff, no problem. If you're slightly hyperextended, but you're trying to do a backwards roll and you know, use, not the, quite on, use the old yeah. Dan Hardy escape yeah. versus GSP, that's oh. no problem. <laughs> I know, right? Um, but that's no problem. But if you're just lying there and just gritting, going, ah, and just holding out until your elbow pops, that's not intelligently defended, so I'm just going to stop the fight. No, definitely. There's so much of that as well. And yeah. One thing with that, I've lost my train of thought with this, but there's so much <laughs> in that. Prime example is um, Brendan Sharp and Trev <laughs> Travis Brown, where he's given the thumbs up, but he's splayed out, bottom back mount. It's just like, <laughs> at this point, you're just surviving. You're not going to get out of the position. If you're not getting out of the position, you're just going to take more damage, so there's, there's no point in carrying on the fight. <clears throat> if you're going to get out of the position, you're taking a couple of shots, one or two shots, that's no problem. But if you're not getting out of the position, you're going to lie there for two minutes and just be punched, 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 around your ears, you know, even on your arms. It's just... Hmm. Again, it's not intelligent, is it? So This is it. One thing I wanted to get into as well, so I could touch on the same sort of topic, is UK, MMA, British sort of events, things, things coming back in action now. Mm. We've been to events with crowds now. You're back getting seen in the UK. Back in, yep. Order's been restored <laughs> and everything has. else. Now, what are you seeing now that you didn't see in the first sort of pre-lockdown kind of era? Anything you're noticing in regards to preparation, time between events, anything you're noticing as a... I don't know, highlighted, highlighted issue. It's almost like a loaded question sort of thing. But. Yeah, no. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that obviously quite a few events were happening quite quick, back mm. to back. Um, you know, especially this sort of last couple of months, I think everybody was sort of like, you know, once the you know the government said we were allowed to then do live events and stuff like that, everybody was like, right, quick train, mm. get in the cage, let's, let's have a fight. And then they were like, right, quick, you've got one month to get ready for the mm. next sort of fight. So I think next year is going to obviously slow down a bit more to like normal. But yeah, I think it, everything happened really fast back to back, um, you know, the last sort of like three, four months, which is good for me because I've managed to, you know, get out there and, you know, get back in there MC and, 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 you know, got a couple of refereeing jobs as well, which I've been well up for and uh, definitely up for doing more next year and stuff. So that was cool. Um, but yeah, as far as the, like the, 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 the shows as such, everything's kind of back to normal, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Everything's, you know... Uh, I've been to Golden Ticket, obviously Battle Arena, you know, I, I, I MC for the Battle Arena and everything's as professional as normal as it was before. Mm. Um, everything's perfectly sound, refereeing's great there again. So, yeah, uh, a couple of the shows were good. Uh, I'm looking forward to next year, to be honest. I mean, there's like a couple more shows mm. sort of happening sort of December time and then it's, uh, you know, the big build-up ready for next year, sort of like end of February, March time, ready for the, the fight season to start again. Well, one thing I wanted to bring up on this topic is activity as an amateur, mm. or activity in general, <coughs> is the temptation is we've had this time off, now it's playing catch-up. Mm -hmm. And the temptation with this, the reason I bring up this topic is, amateur is for learning. So it almost becomes a throwaway thing having a fight. Win or lose, you get experience. Yeah, It's a nice way of saying it doesn't matter if you lose. But in the same vein, if you're not growing from fight to fight, is it worth having back-to-back -back fights? So this is where I wanted to throw on you, is for an amateur now, is it worth going on as many shows as possible with a sensible gap to try and develop themselves? Or is it better to hold out for a certain period of time to then feel they've levelled up a certain stage, say like a stripe's worth, yeah. a belt's worth, the equivalent of, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's a tough one because I think it works really well for both both sort of answers, like well, both sort of questions the way you're asking it, is it's really good to get as much experience as you can. And if you're not injured and you're still keeping fit in the gym, you know, taking fights, you know, on quite quick succession can be good for you just to get that cage experience, you know, to get you in front of the cameras, in, you know, in front of the live crowd, get used to being there, especially if you're looking to obviously go pro, you know, in the future sort of thing. But it's also good to have that little mm. gap, like you say, to level up, you know, get an extra stripe on your, on your jiu-jitsu belt, you know, learn, maybe take a boxing match in between an MMA fight so you've got a little bit more comfortability on the mm. feet standing or, or something like that so you know there's there's no wrong or right with that sort of that sort of I, I don't think there's a wrong or right answer to that um it really depends on on the person individually um i know from experience through my son the way he's sort of like big up dylan yeah big up dylan uh doing really Five well now jiu-jitsu uh, but the way he's progressed so fast is he's just competed all the time and that was the way he, him for him he could put everything he was learning into practice really quick and competing all the time and getting better and better each time he competed um has helped him really well whereas i know other guys that have competed then had you know three or four months off trained constantly in the gym and then they've gone to the next show and then absolutely wiped the floor of everybody 
and that's the way they've learned. So again, mm. it, it literally boils down to individuality. For Dylan competing really regular in jiu-jitsu, I don't know if that's going to work in you know MMA or striking, but in jiu-jitsu that that was really good for him competing so regular um, that he just he kept him hungry and he wanted to like get better and do better at every single competition mm. to get slightly better, even if it was only a week apart, two weeks apart, or a month apart. So for him that worked really well. For other people. They just get disheartened, you know. Mm. Like if they go to one jiu-jitsu competition, and they kind of, you know, get a bronze or they don't even medal, and then they go to another one, and then it happens again. And they go to another one, and it happens again. You know, they can get disheartened. So for them, the the best way for them to train would be to go to one, see what they did right, see what they did wrong, work on that for a month or two, then go to another one and see where their level is. Then see how much they've improved in the gym. Whereas with Dylan, it was just like, get in there. If I do something wrong, I'll do it better on my next one. If I do something wrong this one, mm. next week I've got another competition, so I'll do it better at that one. So it was, it, it's a, it's a toss-up really personally how, how, what works for you. In the way you do things, how do you prefer to do it? Well, this is where this question sort of stems from initially. Yeah. Is I'm trying to work it out still, if I'm perfectly honest. Yeah. And the reason for that is I used to compete regularly in jiu-jitsu, but I yeah. didn't quite have a way of doing it right yet. Mm. So I'd show up, get flustered by the nerves, do something stupid out of just panic, get caught by someone early, get frustrated, and maybe get a second match out of rapid charge or whatever. Yeah. And then do it right because I'm relaxed and I'm sort of thinking, oh, it doesn't matter now. Mm. Rinse and repeat for most of my white and blue belts. And realistically, since having fun, the ones I've done the best in, the ones I've had fun in, very flippant with it. And this is why this conversation gets very, almost contradicting where... I, put, I say with MMA, it's very serious. It's very much you sign your life away. We've seen horrible injuries and everything else. But if you make it out to be this big thing, we talk about the plank analogy where you can walk on it in the flat, you're fine, but put yeah. up in the ceiling, it's everything else. Yeah, of course. You put it as big a bigger thing, you then panic and give it this pedestal, whereas you normalise it, you can perform better. Yeah. So, for example, I've got a couple of jiu-jitsu competitions in December, and right now I'm keeping it very flippant to try and treat it like, you know, it's just a normal role in the gym. Yeah. And... Honestly, it's just trial and error at this point. That's what amateur's been like. So, am- but that is amateur. Mm. It's literally trial and error. This is where you do the trial and error now because, you know, as much as obviously you want to mm. win every jiu jitsu competition, you want to win every MMA fight, you want to win every boxing match, whatever you go into, if you're not going in to win, mm. then you shouldn't really be doing it anyway, really. Um, but that's the, this is the thing. Now is the time you can lose mm. because right now your pro record's still zero and zero. Undefeated. Do you know what I mean? Undefeated pro. So, and that's what people are going to look at eventually when it's all said and done. They're going to look at your pro record. They're not going to look back and go, oh my God, he had 10 pro fights and he was five and five, but he had 20 amateur fights and he was 20 and oh. So do you even know white belt? Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not going to look back at that or they're not going to look back and go, oh my God, like, you know, he's, he's, he's doing really well pro, he's 10 and oh. And look back at your amateur one and be like, oh, but he was 10 and 10 at amateur. They're not going to do that. They're only going to look at the pro. So now's the time to learn how what's best for you. Like you say, go into a jiu-jitsu competition. No, it's any competition. It's just a roll. Just have a little bit of fun, you know, see what happens. Maybe that is a better way for you to mm. think about things and, and process it mentally for then for your MMA eventually. So now's the time to go in there and be mega nervous and go, that didn't work for me. I've got to try and relax myself. Or go in there and be mega hyped up and be like, I've got to rip this guy's head off. Mm. And it works for you. Or going there, be massively lazy and be like, I don't really don't care. Whatever happens, happens. That's kind of my sort of style. Is I go in there, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Just kind of, you know, go with the flow. And it generally works for me. I'm, you hit some I'm, like, nice little judo throws yeah, as well. There we I'm, are. I'm a mega relaxed sort of like, especially when it comes to jiu-jitsu and stuff. Doing judo for so many years, you had to relax in between the matches, you know. And jiu-jitsu is the same. Mm. You know, you've got four or five matches on one day. You can't be, oh, my God, ball of energy, ready for the first match. After that, you just gassed out and you've just gone. You've got nothing Full left. Of yeah, you've got to be like mega relaxed. Yeah, nice and chill. Okay, all right, my name, yeah, cool, right? Get my belt on, cool, mm. stand on the mat. As soon as I bow on the mat, that's when I switch it on. Switch it on, do my stuff. Even when I'm in the match though, I'm still kind of relaxed. I, I learned at a young age, I got really angry. I'm like, oh, I've got to be angry. Yeah. I've got to try and throw him through the floor and end up just making stupid mistakes when I was like, you know, eight years old and getting beat. I got beat by the same fucking guy like over and over name again and shame, name and shame name and shame I can't even shame. remember his name that's the problem I was like, he's not worth mentioning I know he's not worth it anymore no he is worth it because he taught me a valuable lesson I was about 7-8 years old I got so angry and when I saw him across from me I got even more angry because I was like he's fucking beat me 
three competitions in a row now. Stop me four. Yeah, literally. Oh, I got so angry. And he beat me again. And I'm like, why is he beating me every single fucking time? And then eventually I just relaxed and I beat him. And then after that, he never got anywhere near me after that because I was relaxed. I was like, oh, if I can beat him last time, it's easy this time. Boom, beat him again. Oh, I beat him last time twice in a row now. And it's just, you know what I mean? Like, I learned to be so relaxed. Um, during the matches and stuff, and I've just carried that on. But again, that was my learning process, was my judo. He was learning how to mm. deal with the nerves. And, you know, luckily for me, I started at a me- mega young age. So, like, seven, eight-year-old, that's when I was kind of learning, and then I kept that mental going mm. right into sort of, like, my MMA career, boxing and everything else that I've done since then. So, But it's, it's amateurs all about learning. Mm. It's all about learning. Again, you want to win. You want to be a 20 and 0 amateur fighter That's going it. into your pros. You want to be Mohamed Bakayev, don't you? Of you want course to be you do, yeah. 24 and 0 as um, Ami, 5 and 0 as Pro, go to the UFC. The, exactly, the there you go. That's what you. That's that's the ideal world, isn't it? You want to do that, and he wants to stay unbeaten, and then he wants to be UFC champion, obviously. You know, that's a perfect world mm. for him. But, you know, losing an amateur it doesn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily as bad as what it sounds when you've lost a fight. You know, if you go in there, have a great scrap, Pick out some really valuable sort of things that you work well. Pick on some things that didn't work so well and work on them and then make it better for the next one. And like I say, whether it's a week away, three months away, however works best for you working on them little things in the gym. So it's, it's hit and miss with everybody. Like you say, you, you like to work on things and you used to get really hyped up. And, you know, Dylan was kind of the opposite where he just likes to go smash every mm. week, have a competition and, and progress like that. So. I mean, there's always different variables with loads yeah, of things of anyway. And again, it's a huge spectrum. I'm having a conversation with my clients earlier, also, you know, Dan has to know PT, anyone <laughs> wants to know, um, about how his first like white belt comp he did. He thought yeah. the world was on his shoulders. And it sounds ridiculous, you know, an arbitrary competition in the middle of nowhere with other people who also have like full-time jobs. They do yeah. it for a bit of fun. But you sincerely do feel that weight. You feel that kind of burden that, oh, if I don't win, what, what now? And you see even like high-level competitors still feel that same kind of burden. Mm-hmm. And this is where it's interesting. You sort of, this is what I say to anyone who's going through similar things. You know, the whole idea of giving someone else advice is than taking it <laughs> itself is, it is whether win or lose, like normally in the battle arena in the edge bastion, go to the Audi next door, which I led or wherever it is, and look how everyone's just living their lives and doesn't give a shit. Look how everyone in this arena right now really is so engulfed in this moment and this, mm-hmm. these belts, these, everything here. You go outside, people shrug. Nobody people, even knows it's happening. No one knows it's happened. You wake up, the champion or the runner-up and you're the same person. The sun's still going to rise and everything else. Exactly the same. And I'll tell you, one of the things I've said to a few people and I say to myself every now and then, worst case scenario isn't losing. Mm-hmm. Worst case scenario is being there on the sidelines wishing you were in there. 100%. No, I agree with that. That's me at the minute. Mm. I'm getting too old. and yeah, FOMO. Body's too, Ma- body, <laughs> body's too beaten up. Getting too old. Master five. Fucking, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I sit there, I do the ring announcing, I'm like, I wish somebody would just ring announce me and I could fight one more In the blue corner, cast the ledge one. <laughs> ring announce myself. <laughs> just fight with my shirt on, just put some gloves on, yeah. <laughs> Three fucking, pieces on. I, <laughs> I wish that was still me, but no, it is true, yeah. The worst thing you could do is to be on the sidelines. You might as well get involved, get in there, win or lose. Just go out there, have a good scrap, you know, enjoy yourself and, and learn some stuff, you know, learn some life lessons from, from fighting. Well, this is the cliche we sort of hear all the time anyway, that... The lot, like, train hard fight easy sort of thing where the day by day this is something I used to find hilarious where you'd have the horrible shark tanks the t- t- tough train you go in the office and then you feel almost stressed about something and like wait a minute am I stressed about getting an email that's pissed <laughs> me off or this pro fire top turtle on me trying to ground the camera trying to stand back up my coach called me a pussy and I'm not getting there quick enough <laughs> no, right. I think what is stress versus what is just being a bit overwhelmed yeah. being a bit busy big difference Stress management isn't just having a cup of tea and a sit down. It's also, you know, <laughs> getting back to your feet and getting on with it. There's also that, like, line somewhere. Exactly, yeah, yeah. But no, there's just so much going on. And regards of, like, outside of the amateur scene, obviously professionals, we've got cage warriors coming back, double mm-hmm. trouble. A lot of interesting fights on there. Um, I'm not going to name names before I say this sentence here. Where it comes to padding pro records mm-hmm. to then go to the bigger shows, is it a false economy, <laughs> yes or no? And the reason I ask this is if you take the tough fights off the bat, and you have a mixed record, will you still get the same look in if you have, like, the X amount and O from fighting bums? What do you think to that? Promoters are always going to look at that O. Yeah, they're always going to look at, oh, who's 5-0 and o and who's 5-5? Five and five? The 5-0 five and o guy on paper looks better because he's 5-0. and o. Um, But, you know, like I say, when it comes to pro, if you want to be... 
if you're if you're pro and obviously you're striving to be the best you can be in you know the country in cage warriors in in whatever promotion you're you're sort of fighting for you've got to fight everybody that's that's the whole point isn't it to be mm. as best you can to be the best you've got to beat the best it's the old cliche but so yeah padding's I don't, I don't really agree with padding when it comes to pro level <clears throat> padding's learning it's getting you know the zeros you know getting the getting, yeah. the, getting the numbers on your, on your wing column and stuff like that but you know the learning stuff should be done in the amateurs and then when you turn pro you should be up for fighting absolutely everybody if you want to thing it I do agree that you should fight your level I'm not saying that a, an yeah. O guy should be fighting some you know world champion that's had 20 odd fights no mustache and a big beard yeah exactly yeah so I, I, don't, I do agree with that you know you should be fighting at your level but you should be willing to take on anybody at your kind of level, not fighting below your level. Mm. There's no point in you being here and this person being here. And what's the point? There's absolutely no point, there's, you know, except for, like I say, padding your record. There's no, you're not getting anything out of that fight. And the only way you're going to get better, you're not going to get better by beating nobodies. You're going to stay exactly mm. the same. You're just going to have a better record. So then when you do come up against somebody at your level of your record and they haven't been padding, then you're going to be in trouble. So... Again, you know, there's pluses and negatives to both of them as well, mm. I guess. So, and different coaches will have different thoughts on that. So, but me personally, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of padding. You know, I, you know, you should just fight whoever gets put in front of you, and you know, whether it's somebody not as good as you, better than you, same as you, mm. you know, you should just fight them. But yeah, you know, so where take it level by level, but yeah. Where it gets funny is the integrity versus the actual reality of it. Mm -hmm. And you see like the Jake Paul, the people who jumped to the top because they had a few flash things, promoted well and so on yeah. and so forth. And this is kind of the problem. <clears throat> as much as we're all going to play the holy than now, we're, you know, authentic. We've been in this, we're on a real integrity. We're going to fight the best and see what happens, you know. But who's getting paid in the day? Who's feeding their family? Who's living? Who's actually getting to that point? That's it. And this is why when I say padding, although I find it unethical for what it is of selling tickets to your friends or everything else, <laughs> Preparing for someone you're not even intimidated by it seems very solemn valor is a very dramatic way of phrasing it, but not too dissimilar. And I almost get it. I yeah. almost the where I still I give it almost a bit of a caveat is think about if you're fighting someone better than you. Yeah. It's win win. Yeah. If it's if I won, oh I beat the guy who never doubted me. If I lost, you know, I was expecting to be. Yeah. But you see some I call call a guy Tin Can as the, the guy <laughs> Tin Can. He's the guy who's been brought in and last minute he's owing some arbitrary large number. You're going to fight him. You think, okay, I've got to beat this guy. I've got to look good doing it. But otherwise, who am I at this point? Yeah. And obviously you're getting used to performing under that pressure in front of your friends, your family and everything else. And this is where it sort of goes further and further. That's where Cage Warriors normally sieve those people out. Yeah. This is why I like those sort of fights. Now moving on swiftly without naming any names or sort of highlighting what we just touched on. There's a lot of exciting fights in there. I'm going to talk about the lightweight title fight between George Hardwick and um, Mehdi Ben Lekdar. Mm -hmm. What I was surprised about that, though, Joe McColgan was the current lightweight champion. Yeah. So I don't know why he's vacated as such or what's happened with that. Do you know anything about that? I have no idea. I've not even actually looked at the card that much, so mm -hmm. I'm not clued up on the Cage Warriors just yet. It's something I need to look into. But, yeah, I'm, I have no idea why he's vacated. Maybe he's just inactive at the moment. Possibly been stripped for that reason. But then again, if he's inactive and he's planning on fighting for Cage Warriors again, then it would be an interim. Mm. That's what they're doing with the featherweight, right? Mm. You know, they, had the, they had the interim on and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. But Maybe. strange enough as well, you also had Nathan Fletcher and um, Dominic Wooding fighting for the bantamweight title, not interim. Uh -huh. Jack Carrot didn't lose. He had a DQ win over um, that bear, Peter Miller, Petra Miller, the one who yeah, kept yeah. him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that one. And then That's he the went off the radar. I think it's a, maybe a contract thing, whatever else. But yeah, where that maybe. fight is very exciting. George Harbuck's been very active. Both the Harbucks have. Yes. Just on an absolute tear. Both of them undefeated this year. Just constantly in cage warriors. Um, I call them HNCs, hard-nosed cunts. They're just those sort of guys who just... I love a rock. Just, but obviously just they're... Tough, love a scrap. Obviously yeah. they're technical, they're professionals, but when push comes to shove... Just love a scrap. Yeah, love a scrap. <laughs> and they're well, personality and everything else. Yeah, so, they so, love a scrap, they've got personality, and people love to watch them. Exactly. Which is always a bonus. Again, anybody that loves a scrap, people love to watch. Mm. Simple as that. And where it gets even more exciting is Mehdi Ben Lakhdar was the other half of the Joe McColgan fight that made the fight of the year, I think it was 2019. Mm -hmm. Very exciting fight. And with George on the absolute tear and Mehdi Ben Lakhdar being absolutely phenomenal, it's just fireworks. Yeah. But where I say that... Awesome matchmaking, as always, by Mr. Ian Dean. Mm. 
But where it could almost <laughs> go against itself was like the common day um, Harry Hardwick fight. Two hard-nosed cunts who've been in the sport for a while. Yeah. In the form of a bit of a non-event with Harry Hardwick getting kicked in the balls multiple times, which was hilarious. Because I think it was no crowds as well. And you just heard um, Common Day in the distance saying, penis? <laughs> like, just very faintly. And those sort of things are hilarious. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit weird with the crowds back. And it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, I don't know which way I liked it now. Because I kind of like, when, when we first started watching the fights without the crowds, it was like, this is weird. Mm. There's no crowd. This is weird. I can hear every shot. And especially like when it was the um, Tony Ferguson, Justin Gaethje. Oh, I heard oh, every so, shot. Don't talk about that. That was, oh my God, it was like, Bone crushing shots as well. It was horrendous. Speaking of bone crushing shots, did you know Usman broke his hand on Gaethje's head three weeks before the Kobe fight? The last one. Just oh, gone. really? Yeah, he said about it on a podcast recently. Oh, okay. okay. I thought, <laughs> kept that quiet. Imagine your right hand is broken three weeks out from your title fight against someone you know you can't lose to, regards of like everything's oh, built up. Cannot lose to that guy. He went five rounds with him. He went five rounds. With a broken hand. He didn't throw it until he was in the warm up room before he walked out, but either way. Nice. But. Back to cage rules. I came to fans like if you see the Paul Hughes and Morgan Chapa fight, absolute yep. incredible fight. But that is what the crowds really bring that yep. walk out, that atmosphere, that moment. And one thing I liked about that from both of those guys, even before the fight, is they savor the walkout. Mm-hmm. They savor all of it. They embrace the moment, and I think that's almost just forgotten about. And this is something that I can't remember if I was speaking to about this, but even my, my last fight, the one with a lot of nerves, everything else. Obviously, different levels. Was more just an example of that. All the emotions you feel going through these experiences is to savour it. Because you think, oh, I'm fighting tomorrow. Like, I'm sorry, you're marching orders. Like, I've got to do this, got to do that. Oh, I can't eat this. Savour those feelings of like, yeah. love hating it because one day you won't be able to do it anymore. And that is just. Yeah. Ooh, stop reminding me. You, stop, uh, you, start, you have to start <laughs> reffing and start like, you know. You start reffing, yeah. <laughs> now, you've got to do the um, any fight show thing is having your kit in your car in case someone needs a last minute stand. I think I, I think I, I think I have my, my gym kit in, in my actual bag. <laughs> Clark Not Kent. on purpose, but maybe I just leave it in my boot in my car anyway. We'll now, call it um, Clark case. Kent syndrome every now and then. <laughs> just every now and then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm ready. Let's go. But no, so with um, Cage as well, I've got a lot of um, incredible fights. For example, one of my favorite ones is Nick Bagley mm-hmm. against Scott Pedersen. Yeah. So that fight, if anyone's not in the, in the night, oh my God, incredible. So Nick, absolute athlete, absolute phenom throughout his amateur career. Two and I was a pro so far, fantastic stoppages. And Scott, in IMAF, he was the man amateur, crazy amount of fights. He had his debut against Matthew Elliott, one of my friends who does the energy drink rating. This is one of my favorites, if anyone's noticed. Wants to sort me out, <laughs> hook us up. And again, then for a debut, this is part of the same conversation. His debut was against Matthew Elliott. Yeah. Someone who's Team Ireland, everything else, um, judo, wrestling, very pedigree amateur. Someone who is also very respected, tough fight, came up on the wrong side of the decision. Well, fair decision, but, you know, the wrong side yeah. of it. And then got a win after that. And now, obviously, coming back. So one and one on paper doesn't do him justice. But that fight, anyway, is just exciting. Similar sort of matchup as well, regards yeah. to wrestlers and that kind of heavy grappling style. It's very interesting. And again, you get a lot of a lot of interesting fights on that card. Is there any one in particular you've seen pop up? Obviously, intermittent. Well, I don't... With Cage Warriors, they don't pop the full fight card as such. It's quite hard to see who's actually fighting on that show. They sort it of drip feed it in. Yeah, yeah. No, I've literally not seen any of the fight cards yet. So I've, I've got to I've got to do a bit of research on that. So mm. what's the date of the, the event? There's double trouble. I believe it's the 10th and 11th of December. Okay, yeah. I have to double check that. Right. But either way, they're always quite interesting out. ones. Yeah, yeah. I, li- I like the way the Cage Warriors are doing these, mm. like, back-to-back. Obviously, we had the the triple headers and stuff like that, during the lockdowns and stuff like that, and then, you know, this double trouble one. It's, uh, I quite like how they're doing these. It makes sense, though. If you think about the overheads, the planning, just if you need cram to... cram it all together and just do it, yeah. If I'm going to book you to MC somewhere, I mean, stick two days in the side of that, you know, you just get that window, yeah. and you're in the same place. Yes, it's extra cost in the hotel and everything else, but it's not doing it twice. It's not no, finding yeah, another yeah. venue, not having to set everything up twice, take yeah. it down twice. And so on and so forth. It makes a lot of sense. No, it's cool. I quite like that the they're still doing the the the, the group together, like the double ones and stuff. Mm. Even though it's kind of like back to normal now with crowds and everything else, they're still doing them, you know, compressed together. It's quite cool. Kind of festival vibes, you know. Yeah, what I, mean? we I sort like of it. Yeah, there for a little while. Two full days of you know, full lots of fights and stuff like that. It'll be interesting. An absolute hero of the card, Matthew Bond, the man of the trilogy. So with people like him, it's always so inspiring to see. So Cage Warriors put this up, and I'm glad they did. It was his first fight of the first trilogy. Yeah. He was six and six, and I think in no contest or something like that. So yeah. he's six and six, wins that one. He's then seven and six. He wins the next one. 
he then gets a stoppage in the next one. Yeah. So he gets a title shot. Now he's 10 and 6 with the belt. So to go from an even record at mm-hmm. pro, you think, okay, you know, he's he's married, he's got his commitments, he's training, he's co- all this sort of stuff going on. And you think with an even record, where's his career going to go? Not even just from a personal point of him no. himself, just insert fighter here with that record in that situation. To see that progression, like Joe McCogan himself getting the belt at 32 with a full-time job. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. But that's, that's the same as what we just spoke about earlier. Mm. For Matt Bonner, obviously, being regular, back-to-back fights, has worked well for him. He's progressed. Um, you know, obviously, you know, having the layoff, maybe it's it's not kept him as motivated as what he needed to be in the gym and, you know, being six and six and maybe he was fighting like twice a year or maybe three times a year at most, but doing them back to back to back to back fights and back to back camps. Yes. He's not got the, you know, the three, four months, five months of, of being able to progress in the gym, but those shorter sort of steps for progression from fight to fight and doing training camps has worked perfect for him. So for him, that, that suited him better, obviously, just because look at his, uh, Look at the way he's, he's come out of lockdown. Obviously, went into lockdown six and six, come out of lockdown ten and six. I'm trying to be champ. Yeah, there you go. So for him, that's worked. So he's obviously even even in his pro career, I not quite got it right. But now this might be the way that works best for him. Plus, it's comfort and familiarity, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's okay. Even a fight in the edge, bastard. And you go there once or twice. Okay, you know where the toilets are. Yeah. You know the change rooms are. You know if you need this, where it's going to yeah. be. You know the staff, you know the faces, you know how it's going to work. He would have got to know all the Cage Warriors crew. Mm. You know, he would be like, Little oh, yeah, things. cool. Yeah, you know, John over there, he's going to come and get me for my fight. All right, John, how you doing? You're right, mate. Yeah, I'll see you later when I'm ready for my fight. The runners and stuff there, like the hotel's yeah, there. Yeah, the runners. Yeah, exactly. He's got, everything's nice and familiar. So it works well for him, obviously. So And like I say, some people it works, some people it doesn't. Some people like the six months break to, <clears throat> to go from a, a white belt to a blue belt and then next fight from blue belt to a purple or, you know, however long it takes. Some people like that. Some people don't. It's always individual. Now, this is where <coughs> I want to take this a step further. So, one of our teammates, his thing is moved now, anyway, Modestus, he went oh, to yeah. the, when he got to the UFC, one of the questions he was asked frequently was, what are you going to do now? Where are you going to train? Because now you're in that higher level. You're in yep. this bigger platform. And he said, well, I don't change anything because it's got me that far anyway. Before I carry on with that point, what do you think to that? If you've achieved a certain level of what you're doing... Do you fix what isn't broken or do you add things to the toolkit? Um, I mean, there's always room to add stuff. But I, I do quite like fighters that kind of like know where they've been and know who's worked with them and got them to the position where they were. Mm. Um, but, you know, there's no harm in, you know, training with a different partner or going down to a different gym, trying something new out. Um, as long as you're not, you know, stepping over people's toes and stuff like that. And coaches as well. There's so many coaches out there that are like, you're only training with me. Can't go anywhere else. It's not allowed. Why? If they go away for a couple of months, train at another gym, learn some new tools, come back, maybe show you, then you can show the rest of everybody else. So it's it's all learning. You know, it's all good learning. You know, I don't think there's any bad learning as such, you know, unless you really been taught to throw punches like this or something stupid, but you know, hammer fist, I guess. Oh, is that what it's called? <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like, there's no, there's, there's, there the fight, shouldn't sorry. be any bad learning just by learning something new from somebody else. Just because somebody does it, does something differently, doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that's the way they do it. That might work better for you. It might not work better for you. I do like quite like going to different gyms and and experiencing different coaching styles and different coaches. So, yeah, I, I don't mind people going off and doing that, and and I think it's quite good sometimes. But you know, like you say, if. Uh, if you're happy with your team that got you to the big show, then you stick with them. Again, it's it's individual. Everything's individual. So and especially like around the way you gotta you gotta understand how how you learn as a fighter, um, and your coach just to understand how you learn as a fighter. And if he thinks going off somewhere else, maybe to learn something, trying some different training partners and stuff like that might be good for you. Then you know he should maybe force not force you uh, guide you into that sort of way as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my controversy spoon and stir the pot. Yeah. I'm going to poke the bear and I'm going to ask some very leading questions to sort of not <laughs> not to go against your point, but to yeah. give the potential issues with that. Yeah. So say I'm your coach. Yes. I do your planning. I do your programming. I do your nutrition. I do everything. Yeah. Say I then pass one of those reins to someone else. I give someone else your nutrition, someone else your conditioning. How do I know they're still talking? How do I know they're on the same schedule or everything else? Are these things, are these wheels all moving at the same time in the same order, in the same direction? That's one point with that. No, that's true. Another that's thing is, 
you don't know what you don't know. And also, the grass is always greener somewhere else. It's also greener where you water it. So how far you get now, say you're king of the white belts and then you beat another white belt in a competition. Yeah. You think you're the next Hoist Gracie, why not? <laughs> Instead of fill in sure. the blank. <laughs> so you think, no, you're not doing any wrong. You've won all your matches. You think, you know, I'm the man. Blue belt's going to be an absolute breeze. How confident would you be at that point? Because the facility you're at got you to that level where you're beating other people at your level. Do you then feel confident to know you're going to be able to step up at the next rank? And the reason I'm saying in this format is there's no default right answer. Mm. And this is why it's interesting. Obviously, his career in the UFC has been a bit you yeah. know, mixed and now he's been released. But I don't think that's necessarily one result of the other. I think it's a combination of things. Again, it's not my place to say yeah. these things. But the reason I'm bringing this up is if you're taking a step up in, say, professional or promotion or anything else, how, who would you go to to ask that question to? Again, it just depends on how much you trust your coach and how much your coach trusts you, mm. I guess. Um, again, you know, like I keep saying, it is individual, but if, if your coach is doing absolutely everything for you and then he, he lets you go off to this nutrition guy to start doing that, then as a head coach, you should still be talking to this guy. So he's still got to, you know, if he's the head coach, he's still got to kind of control the reins a little bit. He can let that guy go and do the nutrition, maybe let that guy do the strength and conditioning, but they kind of have to report back. That's how it should work. If you're going off to another gym and learning some other stuff, then the coach, you know, maybe go with you and watch what you're doing, what you're learning. Or, you know, at least sort of like have a liaison with one of the other coaches so you can kind of like get filled in mm. on what's happening and stuff like that. That would be the ideal way of doing stuff. Obviously, I know that doesn't always work that way. But yeah, if, if, I, if I was to do it or if, if you was my head coach that like mm. we were saying um, and you was letting me go off to this place and go off to this place... As a, as, a, as a fighter, I'd want you as a head coach to still sort of like want to oversee everything. So you'd be like, right, liaising with this guy and talking to this guy and, you know, find out what, how I'm, well I'm doing in my strength and condition, how well my nutrition's going, where my weight's at at the time and stuff like that. Even though you're, you're not controlling it as a such, you should still be overseeing certain, mm. certain areas. Perfect answer. And this is where you said there, there's a few things with that where it's, how much does your coach trust you? Yeah. And I say that from a point where, I've had to learn what that really means, where you spar with people you know you're comfortable with, people who you can do all right with, who you're going to, you know, aren't going to hurt you. You're going to have a little move around, but you're not going to get that nose to yeah. the grindstone. You're not going to get hurt or a bit pushed. And you get comfortable and you get confidence building and you hear people like GSP talk about how when I was in, especially gay and so on and so forth, but, you know, run with blue belts and all these sort of things. And then you think, oh, if, if the, that guy's doing it, I've got to do that as well. And then you get this kind of, not holier than now, but you sort of, there's an expression where a little bit of wisdom is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. You think you know a lot and it's the Dunning-Kruger effect. And this sort of thing where you think you know more than you do. Mm -hmm. And this is where these lines are quite blurry, where think about where you had your amateur fight. You think, I'm the man now, next McGregor. I need my own coach, I need my own staff, all this sort of thing. <laughs> or do I still go in the normal classes? I still go in the group classes, yeah. it's all one-to-ones now. What point do you think that should change? Do you think it should stay the same as being in the group sessions versus trading that out for one-on-one -on -one time? Yeah, it's, it's hit and miss with different people. Um, I, I still like joining in with the classes. I still jump on, even though I'm not the most experienced jiu-jitsu guy, like pure jiu-jitsu, mm. but I still jump in the beginner classes. I know I'm not a beginner level, you know, I am, you know, I'm a blue belt now. Really. Ooh, you quit <laughs> but, now, finally. No, I, that's it, I it took long enough. I'm injured, I can quit, I'm done. Um, but, you know, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a blue belt now, but I'll still quite happily jump on with a first time on and go in a class with them. You know, you can still drill, you can still learn, you know, basics. Basics wins fights. I'm a big fan of basics anyway. Um, so, you know, I even though, even at MMA, I jumped in, you know, bef before I got injured, but I was jumping in, and the beginner MMA classes with like the university students that have never done anything mm. before, you know, and we've got a coach Max who technically on paper I'm a lot more experienced than Max, but I'll quite happily jump in with Max on his class and learn what he's got to show. Do you know what I mean? Just mm. because I've been doing it a lot longer and I'm more experienced, I've still got stuff to learn from somebody who's technically on paper not as experienced. He's, Max is an amazing coach um, and doing really well at Nottingham MMA um, with the MMA and wrestling sort of side of stuff. Um, and I, I love joining him with his classes, which are all quite beginner and quite basic for, for some of the beginner classes, obviously. I love doing that sort of stuff. So for me, that works. 
I like to like you know practice my little basics and stuff like that. But then it is also good, you know, in the mornings at the you know six a.m. sessions, mm. the sort of thing like that. We'll go and I'll do a one-to-one boxing session with you know whoever's in the gym, whether it be my friend Nico who, who trains, mm. and obviously Dylan now as well, or any of the guys that you know want to come down in the morning. I'll have a coach a little one-on-one, or they'll do a little one-on-one coaching with me and stuff like that. So it's you know I like I like both, which works well for me. So it depends on everybody's different. Well, this is the point itself. And you see, mm. I'll give an example. You see over on Instagram, like Fearless MMA, you see Joshua Brewer training with Jake Hadley and Andy yeah, Yates yeah. a lot. Those three seem to be training a lot, very consistently. And I think that's the happy medium where you're getting a lean amount of what you need. Because if you take away the class environment to what you actually did in that group session versus what you're doing in a one-on-one time, yeah. what's the quality there? So this is something Ash Williams talks about, something I've quoted to the death of it, which is going to school isn't what you need to get the eight, but it's the minimum to get that. The attendance is half the battle, but the effort is the other half. And yes, I trained all the time. Yes, I went to every session. What did you do there? How much of the time was spent chatting? How much time were you rolling with the guys who were better than you? How many questions did you ask? How much did you think about your roles? How much did you review it in reflection? Loads of things like that. And I put my hands up as much as everyone else will with this, you know. Some days I'm knackered, some days I'm a bit easier on myself, some days I'm harder on myself. It fluctuates. Yep. Some but days you just can't be asked. That's when it. You go to the class, you kind of sit at the back and you do, you know, right, drill 10 times and you do four. And you're like, yeah, yeah you'll go, you'll go, you'll go. And yeah, we all do that every now and again. When we Give it a technical bother. round. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. But, you know, and then other times, you know, you are a bit more switched on and the coach will be like, right, drill 10 times and you do 12. You've done the extra two. Mm. You know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's hit and miss and what's worked for you and you've got to listen to your body as well. That's one of the main things. Like that- you say, you can't, you can't go to a class, and like you say, you can't go to a class since the effort you put into it. You can't go to a class for six months and do, you know, when, you, when you've been asked to do 10, ro- uh, 10, 10 um, drills of a, of a technique and you're just doing it four times for six months, you can't expect to be at the same level as the person who's next to you who's been doing it mm. 10 times for six months every single time he's been asked to do it. So it depends on how much you want to progress and how much you want to put in to get out. Well, comparison is always the thief of joy in general. That's a butchered quote anyway. It's constantly referred to. And this is the thing. Say you start, I don't know, in January, but someone who started then in the April picks up quicker than you did, beat you in the rounds, think, fuck, what was this for? I've wasted my time. And the real answer is there's so many other variables. 100%. You can't even have that conversation. It's not worth it. No. And you'll see, like, the, the white belts who have got this wrestling background, this athleticism, and you think, why am I not running through them? Says, well your techniques aren't doing what they should be doing because you're not applying them properly. And application and knowing techniques are very different things. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, there's just so much going on. And one thing I always want to hark back to is belts are very important for the progression, for the measurements and so on and so forth. But you need that boxing class mentality that no one's got a belt on. No one, you don't know their experience. But when they they punch you in the face, you've got to be able to (laughs) deal with it. It doesn't matter if it's their first day or their X amount of thousandth day. What are you going to do when they punch in the face? Are you going to get out of the way or are they going to hit you? And if they hit you, then what are you going to do? You can't say, oh, I've been training long, go light. No. Then what? And having that, you know, fight or flight and also just taking yourself away from that. Because I'm guilty as anyone else. As soon as you, like, you think you're advanced, think you're more experienced than someone, take your foot off the gas, you relax a little bit. That's why no gi and things like that in MMA especially is whether you're more experienced than me or not, if you're on top of me punching me in the face, I've got to deal with it. 100%. I don't care what your experience is. Punch yeah, is a punch, you know what I mean? Definitely. Uh, there's a lot to get into still, but one thing I want to speak about is the sponsors. So we've got the English Hypnotist. He's sponsored us for since almost the beginning, and he's been fantastic. So Richard Hart, he's phenomenal. He's one of these, when it comes to mindset, we talk about it a lot. And everyone's got their own way of dealing with it. And this is why, given these testimonials, are very hard to really give a value across. It's a very personal thing. Mm-hmm. I went with him in my last camp, and it changed a lot. It helped me deal with the actual stress going into it the certain like, roadblocks I was hitting at certain stages, reviewing things and having that support network for that more in-depth experiences. And hypnosis in itself is a very, it's a very personal experience where you can feel these emotions like lifting. And again, it, I don't want to give two specific examples because it's very person to person how you deal with yeah. it. But I definitely think it's worth a conversation regardless if it's for competition, for your own well-being, for development. And much like any kind of treatment investing yourself, it's not recovery back to basic it can be from where you are to that bit further again if you're going to spend this much time with your physical training your nutrition everything else why is your mental side the one lacking because mm-hmm. i'll be the first to admit that's been one of my biggest roadblocks yeah same yeah and then a lot of my losses in 
MMA, jiu-jitsu, everything else have come from my own self-doubt, the lack of confidence, all these sort of things, these things you set yourself up. It's not a sob story, more the point of, you know, these are my things. I think I'm hitting this wall. It's not a technical thing I'm working in the gym. You show me, I'll show you the amount of escape to everything else, but you put me under those bright lights, that kind of pressure. Sometimes I used to fold. Yeah. I'm not like that anymore, but I've had to work on that. I've had to build that. Obviously, there's, it could be with me, it's another conversation. You know my point. <laughs> Principle still stands. You make these improvements. You make this mental growth. You build this toughness up and, Rich has been fantastic for building. I want to make sure I got that in, make sure he knows how fantastic he's been. And people who don't know him throughout this, it's definitely worth the conversation, 100%. And also Chapel Place Studios have been just phenomenal helping us out. So big up my guys. <laughs> the absolute, because with these podcasts anyway, this early days thing still, it's still yeah. in infancy. And um, without Stuart, David and everyone else, just been nice being, help, helping us with everything else. And like Martin as well. It's just one of these where I can't, even get the words out how much it means because this is something that has been a passion project for ages and to get this from my bedroom to a studio to everything else this wouldn't be possible without their support doing all phones together when I was in Thailand and you're in England yeah, tin cans and just shouting around here with a lovely background with a, with a merch and how it started you know, versus how it's going <laughs> all these nice an- camera angles trying to look <laughs> nice both all, all angles <laughs> angles and light and stuff about we know how it goes but nice no, massive shout out to the people who are helping us because Above all else, everything I can give back, we can support and sponsor people. It's all through these guys as well. So no, I appreciate everyone. Definitely. And if my PT clients listening, all of you are keeping me out of an office job, and I appreciate you more than you ever know. <laughs> um, a few things to also catch up on, also wrap up, and let these guys enjoy their evening. Is the UFC? We yes. talk about various cards and bits and bobs. There's a few highlights, and one thing we mentioned about pre-show was Bryce Mitchell against Edson Barbosa. Yes. If you that, just seen it on my Instagram. If that doesn't get your balls tingling, you're not, you're not an MMA yeah. fan. I don't know yeah, what's going I, on with look, you. I got, here's, look, you're just talking about the fight. I cannot wait for that fight. I literally just saw it on my Instagram, mm. like, what, half an hour before I, I turned up to do this with you. I was sat on the train coming back from London. I was like, no, 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 flicking through. I was like, holy shit, that is a fucking fight. You got Edson Barbosa's, like, what, 22 mm. and 10, I think, something like that. But, you know, one of the savages when it comes to leg kicks and striking in, in the whole of the UFC. And then Bryce Mitchell was just mm. a crazy motherfucker. He's just nuts, isn't he? But in the best kind of way. Just absolutely crazy. And, you know, was he 12 or 14 or no? Mm. So I think he was losing the ultimate fight. I can't remember what it was, but he was in the ultimate fighter season with Tyler Diamond. Losing the fighter, but that doesn't count on your pro record. It's, does it not? That's why I was no, confused with it. No, it depends on when he lost. If you lose in the final, it's a three-round fight, so it's an actual fight. Mm. If you lose on the TV show, it's only two a two-round round fight, so it's classed as an exhibition. So I'm going to reverse, you know, reverse card that question. If it's a draw in the TV show, they have a third round. Would that not then make it? No, I think it still counts as an exhibition. Mm. I think everything that happens on the actual show in the house is classed as an exhibition fight because it's for a TV show. Whereas the finale is obviously they've had a full training camp. They've been home training with their own team. And then, you know, it's like a full mm. thing. So I think that's the only one that actually counts on their pro record. Mm. Um be the way the point still stands. So anyway, one... he's he's on paper he's I think fourteen and zero. Edson Barbos is twenty two and ten. Obviously, he's got massive experience. You know, been around the block, been in the UFC for years. Bryce is a crazy fucking up and comer who's just you know thug nasty. Fucking no, not thug nasty. What? Is, yeah, that's it's right. Thug yeah, nasty, thug yeah. nasty. That's it. Yeah, the camo shorts. Yeah, the camo <laughs> shorts. Thug nasty. Got his own coloured shorts. Got twister in the thing. Yeah, exactly. there's so much going so, on with that. Um, mate. one thing I touched on before we start, I had to pause myself because I love this story so much. So, if anyone hasn't seen it, Theo Vaughn had um, Bryce Mitchell on his podcast. The most, like, South American thing you've ever heard in your life. That sort of southern sort of thing. <laughs> it's like Cletus and steroids. But one story he told, it was disgusting. So, what happened, the gist of it was, so he was doing some work on a roof with a drill. And what does anyone do when they've got a tool belt? They put it down the trousers oh. for some reason. <laughs> but the power drill that's plugged in, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> That's giving me a tingle in different ways. Now. I'm not going to go into the full <laughs> details, but listen to the full story. And you, oh my God, you just get that little. Yeah, you know, pit in your stomach. You're about to walk out a little bit of. Oh, it's like empathy. But no, it's an exciting fight. And again, I don't want to go into too much detail regarding predictions and stuff because there's so many variables. I don't like to give predictions anyway. But where it's an interesting conversation is you get the veteran who's experienced, which can almost be a double edged sword where you have your biases, you have your game, you have the same things you see. Do you change much? We have the up-and-comer, the people, the guy who's in there now. He's new blood. He wants to keep growing and expanding. What happens there? Mm. And it's a striker versus, technically a striker versus a grappler. Mm. You know, 
think Nasty's got some nasty jiu-jitsu. Um, Edson Barbosa's got some nasty striking, especially mm. them low kicks. The, the fucking the switch kick on Edson Barbosa is faster oh, than disgusting. anything I've ever seen. So it's a crazy fight. But he's been dropped a few times, but been KO'd as well. So this yeah, is where nice. where did your confidence go after that? Yes, in the gym's one thing. Yes, in the cage is another thing. But remembering he looks that good at featherweight still. Though. That's what I was amazed about going. That's like out at Bantam. Like, what's that about? Oh. Yeah, that's another one that's coming up as well. Mm, I don't fun. Mm. What a fight. But yeah, I don't know. Who who do I think's going to... I love Aldo, but I think Fon's got it. I think the pace and the jab is just unreal. I think he's just going to outscore Fon's it. Fon's got slick, slick boxing. That jab is nice. Mm. So, yeah. I don't know. Aldo. You see, oh, Aldo, he's, you know, he's getting a bit old now. He's been around, but he's not. He's fucking still only like, what, 32 or 33 mm. or something stupid like that. He's just been around for so long. And he was champion for so long. We just think he's like, you know, in his 40s or something like that. But so he's not. He's still... Here's the random stir in the pot question. Go so, on. say Aldo beats Font. Yeah. Does he fight Sanhagen? Does he fight Aljo? Or winner of Aljo and um, Jan? What no. do you reckon? Or... No, I think Sanhagen would be a nice one. I think, fun the, one. I think the winner out of both of them, Fon or Aldo, to fight Sanhagen would be a good one. Because mm. um, that fight. But against... then again, who's next for for? Well, TJ Dillashaw is next for the champ, right? No, it's um. Uh, no, I'm saying, but what I'm, yeah, oh. Aljo and Jan, the winner of that. Oh one, yeah. TJ Dillashaw is mm. next for for, the, for, for, though, for whoever man. wins the championship, which I think Jan's going to win it. He's unreal. I love that fight against Sanhagen was crazy, and just seeing him in general. Yeah, that would have fight. Sanhagen, like he's an absolute savage as well. Mate, that's such a such a crazy top sort of like five or six. One thing with Sanhagen, and also Yan, which was so fantastic seeing that together, was a big thing with MMA and MMA wrestling, is switch hitting really complements itself, closing that gap, using a diverse range of strikes, but also closing that distance. Mm. Both doing a lot of it. You <coughs> see where. They'll step and throw, which in traditional striking is always seen as, you know, off balance, it's negative, mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff. But the setups, the follow ups, I mean, there's too many examples to give, but you see like the spinning kick set up with the overhands and the hammer fist and so on and so forth. The absolute poetry of that. But this is where your beginner classes will help with this sort of stuff. Yeah. Because when you're in that sort of situation, I'm not to that extent, but you can't think too specific. You've got to think concepts. You've got to think, what am I seeing? Yeah. How do you react? What do you do next? And a lot of it is, you know, I've thrown this side, so this side's loaded. They're opening up this side. I create this angle to then open up that side. You're seeing, you're analyzing. Mm -hmm. This is where you get your jab nice, you know, where your range is, you know, where your movement is, you get your feints. And then if you get your southpaw as well, you diversify your range. And this brings me to the sort of, well, that's the final question as such, but one I really want to get into <laughs> is you're starting from scratch. Do you then stay with your dominant side in everything you practice, or do you go half and half split with Southpaw and Orthodox? That's a tough one, isn't it? Mm. Um, I like to switch a lot, but then again, that comes from obviously me starting in judo, and like a lot of wrestlers again in America, when you do sort of like a judo sort of wrestling sort of grappling based thing, you generally stand with your right. Your, your strong yeah, side your strong forward. Side, yeah. yeah, so naturally for me doing judo, my strong side forward would be southpaw stand striking. So I got really used to standing that way. Then when I finally started doing Muay Thai later in years, they were trying to get me to stand, you know, left foot forward. So because I'm actually right handed. Mm. Um, and for the first six months, I think I was, you know, standing flat footed for most of it because. I'm standing left foot forward and then slowly creeping back to... And you get the crisscross. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, yeah, really weird. So um, so for me, it was really good to learn both straight away because I felt comfortable in both sort of stances anyway. Mm. Um, I definitely trained more orthodox to start with to get me feeling comfortable that way. And then, you know, I could switch um, to my sort of judo stance um, and then still be able to throw punches from there. Um, I, I, I've got to... I've got to go with, personally, I like the fact that people are learning to do switch stances because it makes it so awkward for people. Mm. You can't get used to a certain certain way, a certain style of fighting. You know, if you've got a perfect, a normal right-hander, um, you, you can game plan for that. But if you've got somebody who's going to switch halfway through or even throw a couple of shots, mm. to, you know, circle out, then switch in and throw like a left high kick and then a, a left straight off the backhand afterwards, it's, it's so much harder to... 
to, to game plan for that and so much harder to, mm. to learn to defend. I mean, this is something you see even at the amateur sort of level. Yeah, and definitely. something when um, my friend Denzel Chibondo, before when he's title fight against um, Nicholas Lucas. Yeah. So where that is very, very exciting and where it was, it can't be appreciated enough. It's still obviously a bit of bias, obviously, my mate. But So Nicholas Lucas with his karate combat background, you've watched some of his fights. His striking is just... Yeah. Really, and, really and with nice. Denzel, he's one of these who will fight and fight and fight regardless. So to be in that kind of opportunity to stand and bang and not have the... I don't know, to back off sort of thing. It's fighting smart and using the flurry to then cover the space, smother, all these things you see. Mm -hmm. The outside look at it and you think, oh, it's just hugging, it's just whatever else. But to be able to get in and keep someone in that position and to stifle all of that and make them look messy is phenomenal. Yeah. But anyway, I'll let um, yourself and everyone else crack on this evening. But thank <laughs> you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, thank for, you for so much. So, again, I can't say this enough. There's so many people I want to yeah. thank for all this. Also, I'm on Sam Co. Ooh. so... My friend from the gym, he made this leather wallet from scratch. Fisty cuffs, absolutely blown away by that. And everyone who's been involved at every different stage of this, because ultimately this is a passion project. Yeah. This is, it doesn't even feel like work because everything about I love. And I can't thank anyone enough for helping make this. Everyone who listens, everyone who gets involved and drops me a message, buys the kit, all this sort of stuff. Like the reason I promote the kit the way I do, the more sales get reinvested, I can sponsor events, sponsor fighters, again, make the gym trips. And at some point, be able to pay these guys back for everything they've been doing. But now, I appreciate everyone a lot. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, man. Cheers, buddy. Take care.